In this video, we're going to prove Stokes' theorem. So what Stokes' theorem says is that the integral over a manifold of the exterior derivative of a differential form is equal to the integral over the boundary of that manifold of the original differential form. So there's some things you have to uh, say about this before you know this simple looking uh, equation actually makes sense. So m is an oriented, smooth n-manifold. Uh, with boundary here. I mean, the boundary could be empty. And omega is a compactly supported uh, n minus 1 form on M. So compactly supported. Remember that the support of omega is all points in um, M where omega at P is non-zero. And it's the closure of this set. And so omega is compactly supported if the support of, um, so omega is compactly supported if the support of omega is compact. So this is how we can talk about Stokes' theorem on non-compact manifolds. Um, if M is compact, then of course all differential forms on M are um, compactly supported. Some more things um, to say. So the boundary of M has the induced orientation. So the, the outward normal first orientation that's induced from the orientation on M. And um, when we actually are computing the right-hand side, we're probably gonna have to change coordinates because omega is an N minus one form on M, but M is an N manifold and so we're actually integrating on an n minus one manifold. So we'll have to change coordinates to do um, to compute the right hand side. And then I guess one caveat. Okay, so first of all, um, in this video we're going to do the proof, and then the next video we'll talk about consequences and some examples. Um, it, one thing, um, final thing to make a note of is that if um, n is equal to one, then the boundary of M is a N minus one manifold, so it's a zero manifold. So then the right-hand side is just a finite sum. So for example, say if M is like this one manifold, um, then, and it's oriented somehow, then we consider the, the right-hand side, the integral of omega over the boundary of M to be the value of um, omega, which is now just a function at um, this point and added to the value at that point, and then you subtract the value of these two points, and then nothing happens with this circle because um, it doesn't have any endpoints. Okay, so we're going to prove in, um, we're gonna start our proof in a very special case and then increase the generality from there. So first of all, we're going to assume in the, the first case that M is just the upper half space. So remember that this is um, all points uh, x1 through xn in Rn, where xn is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so omega has compact support. So that implies there is some big number r um, such that the support of omega is contained in this rectangle, which we're going to call A. So it's given by um, coordinates negative r to r for all x1 through xn minus 1, and then coordinates zero through r um, for the last coordinate. So there's n minus one of these. So in, for example, in the, um, in the case n is equal to two, then we have, um, so omega is supported uh, somewhere, has some compact support. So m is this upper half space. Omega, let's say the support of omega looks like this. So this is the support of omega. So then in this case, I would choose R so that, um, that the rectangle with side length here, the side length is um, 2R, and then the height is going to be R, so maybe I'll make it a little bit taller, 
um, contains uh, the support of omega. So this length is r as well. OK, so I can always pick r large enough um, because the support of omega is compact. And then in these coordinates, I can write omega as the sum from i equals 1 to n of omega i, some function omega i of x1 through xn, um, dx1 wedge all the way out to omitting dx i. So I'm going to put a hat over that to say that I'm omitting it, wedge all the way out to dx n. So this notation, what it really means is dx i uh, minus 1 wedge dx i plus 1 wedge, etc. But we like to just write the, um, the hat um, to show that we're omitting dx i. DXI uh, because it's simpler and it sort of emphasizes that we're emitting DXI. Okay, so now let's compute um, compute D omega. So I can just take um, sum from I equals one to n of D omega I wedge uh, DX one wedge all the way out emitting DXI wedge all the way out uh, to DX n. And uh, then this is now the sum over i and j. So it's a double sum from i and j equals 1 to n of d omega i by dxj dxj um, wedge dx1 wedge all the way out wedge dxi omitted wedge all the way out to dxn. Um, but now the only term in d omega i that's going to actually survive is uh, is dx is the dxi term because um, when I take this wedge product, this dxj is going to show up somewhere, unless it's dxi itself. So I can rewrite this as the sum from i equals one to n. So for each i, only um, j equals i will work. So I can write this as d omega i dxj uh, dx. Uh, sorry. I just went through this whole thing, dxi wedge dx1, wedge all the way out, emitting dxi here, wedge all the way out to dxn. And then I'd like to reorder this, so I'd like to put my dxi where it belongs. Um, so that means I'm going to be introducing a minus sign. I'll be introducing i minus 1 minus signs because I have to make i minus 1 swaps. And now I just have dx1 through dxn. Okay, so this is um, this is d omega as we've computed. So now we want to integrate um, d omega over the upper half space, which is the manifold. And because integration is linear, I can just integrate each term. So this is the sum from i equals one to n of um, negative one to the i minus one integral over the upper half space, d omega i, dxi, dx1, wedge, all the way out to dxn. OK, and I can also rewrite this. Um, because omega is compactly supported, uh, it doesn't matter. Like I, The bounds of my inter integral can be just my box a. It doesn't have to, I don't have to go beyond that because the integral of omega out here is just going to be 0. So I can rewrite this now as the integral, or sorry, the sum from i equals 1 to n, negative 1 to the i minus 1. Um, integral, so integrating from i uh, 1 in the inmost, x1 inmost to xn outmost, this will be the integral from 0 to r, negative r to r, integral from negative r to r, uh, d omega i, dx i, dx1, uh, dxn. So I can just remove the wedges and compute this like a normal integral. OK, so now using uh, Fubini's theorem, I can change the order of integration. So I can do the xi integration first. And if I um, am assuming that i is not equal to n, so if I just forget about the last term, I get that this is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n minus 1, negative 1 to the i minus 1, integral from 0 to r, negative r to r, negative r to r, d omega i, dx i, dx i, dx 1, all the way out, emitting dx i to dx n. And then I need to add back in 
um, negative 1 to the n minus 1, integral from 0 to r, negative r to r, negative r to r, d omega i dx i, oh sorry, this one is i equals n, d omega n dx n, um, dx1 through dxn, just leaving this last term as it was. So I can simplify all of these terms with i less than n. Um, basically, uh, I can integrate, so integrating this part um, here using the fundamental theorem of calculus, so I'll just uh, put this in a box and bring it down here. So the integral from minus r to r of d omega i dx i dx i is by the fundamental theorem of calculus um, omega i where at uh, sort of the point x i equals r minus omega i at the point x i equals minus r. And the thing is, because the support of omega is contained in this closed box, these are both zero. So I actually get that everything, um, all of these terms with i less than n are all zero. So what I end up getting is just this bottom part um, in, my, in my integral. So I get uh, the integral over the half space of d omega is equal to this. And then I don't want that uh, red line. Okay. So now we need to compute this final term. And what I can do is change the order of integration again. So this is negative one to the n minus one. Um, and then I can do my uh, integral from zero to r first. And then um, using the fundamental theorem of calculus, I get that this is uh, omega n at x equals r minus omega n at x equals zero. And then now I need to integrate this from dx1 to dx n minus one. But again, here, this term is zero um, because my omega is supported uh, below, there's like, you know, all this space below um, the line x n equals r. So what I end up getting is um, one extra negative sign, uh, negative one to the n, integral from negative r to r, integral from negative r to r, uh, omega n x1 through xn minus one, zero dx one through dxn minus one. Let's clean that up a little bit. Okay, so this is this is um, the integral over the upper half space of d omega. And now I want to relate this to the integral over the boundary of the upper half space of omega. So, um, so I want to relate to the integral over the boundary of the upper half space of omega, which is the integral, so this is the same thing as the integral, so omega I can write as the sum um, from i equals 1 to n omega i uh, dx i, you know, dx1 wedge all the way out, omitting dx i wedge all the way out to dx n. Um, but, and, and again, like before, I can interchange the, um, the sum um, and the integral sign, but also I can reduce to just considering the intersection of A and the boundary of um, the upper half space because, again, um, omega is going to be zero sort of in the rest of the upper half space that's not this part inside my uh, rectangular region A. So, um, so I, can, I can restrict to A, and also because I'm in the upper half space, or the boundary of the upper half space, I can just consider omega i at x1 through xn minus 1, 0. And then the same dx1 wedge all the way out to dx i omitted wedge all the way out to dxn. Okay, 
So, um, so if I ever have a dxn term, um, so if i if i is not equal to n, um, then this integral is actually going to be zero because dx so then uh, xn is not varying in um, the boundary of the upper half space. So this will this term will always evaluate on anything you know any tangent vector to the upper half the boundary of the upper half space that I plug in I'll always get zero. So what I need to do is I need to only consider the term where i is equal to n because this last term will be omitted. Um, so I can throw out every uh, every term every value of i except i equals n and I'll get um, the integral over the upper half space boundary of the upper half space um, of omega n x1 through x n minus 1, 0, dx1 wedge all the way out to dx n minus 1 as the integral um, of omega over the boundary of the upper half space. So what my goal is, is to show that whatever is in this blue box is the same as what's in this blue box, because I want to show that the integral of d omega over the upper half space is equal to the integral of omega over the boundary of the upper half space. So this is looking pretty good, um, but the only problem is this minus sign. And what um, you can show is that the minus sign actually just takes into account the orientation. So um, we'll do some smaller examples, and then you can do the general case on your own. So. Um, so for example, if n, let's do n equals 2, then the upper half space, um, the upper half space looks like this, and the boundary of the upper half space is oriented. So if I draw my orientations, um, the boundary of the upper half space is oriented with uh, dx2, or dy, as we normally call it, um, this orients the boundary of the upper half space. Sorry, d, it should be dx1. Um, dx1 orients the boundary of uh, h2. Um, but, so in this case, where n is equal to two, um, I get no, I should get no minus sign, right? Because this term will be um, just one. And, and these two terms will be equal. These two integrals will be equal. But if n is equal to three, then I am considering H3. And um, so in this case, I am considering the upper half space like this. This is like X, Y, Z. And with the outward normal first orientation, uh, I would have, you following the right hand rule, I have some orientation like this. And so then the orientation um, of the boundary of the upper half space would be, um, Wait, I think I messed these up. Um, yes, they're the opposite. So one, two, three, like that. And so then it would be dx2 uh, wedge dx1 would orient the boundary, the boundary of the upper half space, the three-dimensional upper half space. So I need to introduce one minus sign. Um, and this pattern continues as n increases, which is what in, uh, explains this minus sign here. Okay, so the next case, so we've, we've proven Stokes' theorem in the case where m is the, the upper half space. So now we want to consider another special case where m is just equal to all of Rn. So here, this is actually easier. Um, so in this case, we use the same computation except you want to use the cube um, negative r to r uh, to the nth power. So instead of having this final um, zero, zero to r uh, product, we just have negative r to r there as well. And um, in this case, this implies that the i equals n term vanishes in both computations. Um, and so, or, and especially the i equals n term vanishes in the d omega computation. 
So this implies that the left-hand side is equal to zero, and the right-hand side is equal to zero because the boundary of Rn is empty. So the boundary of Rn doesn't have a boundary, um, so the right-hand side is zero as well.